Good morning, everybody. Good morning. And welcome to Gospel Saving Church. Praise be to God. We get another day to come into the house of the Lord, which is my home in McKinney, Texas, which we transform every Sunday morning into a little studio for YouTube and SoundCloud and for a little home church here with all in my neighborhood and all anywhere that want to come can come and join us. And everybody's welcome in my home for church on Sunday mornings. 1015 is when we record Sunday morning, 1015. God willing, almost every Sunday morning since we started almost a year and about five months now we've been going. So praise be to God. We're in Matthew chapter 14 today. Going to be in verses 34 through 36. And uh, I'll get to the title of our sermon, but if you would join me in a word of prayer, please, let's ask the Lord to bless our service. Ask the Lord to to, uh, help us understand what He has to say to us today. We we can't do anything without the Lord's help. Nothing. So join me in a word of prayer. Lord Jesus, thank you so much, Lord, for bringing us here this morning, Lord. Thank you so much for all those that tune in all over the world, Lord God, from McKinney to Allen and to Plano and to wherever, Lord, and to the ends of the world, Lord God, because that's where you said to bring the gospel. Start in Judea and Jerusalem and go to Samaria and then to the ends of the earth, Lord. So that's what we even do here, Lord God. We go here in McKinney and then we also go to, we've also been to Plano. We've also gone to Dallas and then, Lord, with Lord, your help and your wisdom and your guidance, Lord, we've gone all the way to all over the whole world, Lord God, and I never thought I'd see it, but thank you, Lord, for this little ministry. I just pray that we would continue to touch people's lives and hearts, Lord. I thank you, Lord, for everything that you do for us, but Lord, I'm also thankful that we get to do a little something back for you, because Lord, we can never repay you for what you did for us, but Lord, I just do this what I do, and we gather together just because we have thankful hearts. And so we're th- so thankful, Lord God, that we just get to honor you this morning, Lord. And pray you bless this message, bless this service, Lord. I pray you give us all open hearts to hear. Give me words to say upon the words that I have to say from the Scripture, Lord. Give me words to say. Lord, give us all hearts to understand, ears to hear. May we all have ears to hear this morning, Lord, please. All of us. And again, Lord, may we just not be hearers of the word only, but may we be doers. Because it's not the hearer of the word that's blessed and gets the promises, Lord. It's the doer of the word that gets the promises and reaps the benefit, Lord. We just love you and we praise you, ask that you bless this word. And just please, Lord, implant it into our hearts, Lord, by your Holy Spirit, Lord. Implant it into our hearts and help us to grow in you and sanctify us, Lord God. Sanctify those of us that are yours. And draw those that are not yours unto you. I love you and praise you. And I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Matthew 14, 34 through 36. Our title of our sermon today is, They Made It to the Other Side. They Made It to the Other Side. So if you guys want to read it with me, And we'll get to talk about it. Matthew 14, 34. The Bible says, When they had crossed over, they came to the land of Gennesaret. And when the men of that place recognized him, they sent him out into all, or they sent out into all the surrounding region, brought to him all who were sick, and begged him that they might only touch the hem of his garment. And as many as touched it, were made perfectly well. So I get to talk on today again. As I said last week, we talked about last week, about how Christ was and is patient with seeking sinners, with doubting, seeking sinners. I get to actually speak on another topic that's very dear and very close to my heart. Where is it and what is it? We actually get it in verse 34. I'll read it again and then I'll explain. 34, when they had crossed over, they came to the land of Gennesaret. So just as the title of the sermon said, they made it to the other side. Remember, they made it. 
They were stuck in the ocean. Seems like a small little detail that they made it, but that's actually where we're going to spend the majority of our message today is in verse 34. Because the fact that they made it to the other side is may, may seem tiny, may seem very insignificant, may seem. But you know what they say is things aren't always what they seem, are they? Things, things can be greater than they seem. And in this here, this little detail, this little fact that they made it to the other side is actually huge. It's actually the magnitude of the whole entire universe, believe it or not. So why? Why is this little detail so important? Why is this little, little insignificant seemingly detail, seemingly insignificant detail so important? Well, before Jesus came to the disciples and got in their boat, they were really struggling and fighting that rough sea and that terrible storm that they were in. And they were trying to cross over to the other side. Jesus had given them the command, cross over, go in the boat and cross over to the other side. But if you remember correctly, we were talking about something along the lines of 16 to 18 hours that they were trying to cross over. And yet they found themselves only still halfway across the sea after fighting for so very long. In fact, verse 30 says, but when he, Jesus, saw that the wind was, or when, excuse me, when he, Peter, saw that the wind was boisterous, he was afraid, and he beginning, beginning to sink, cried out, saying, Lord, save me. Well, that word boisterous there, describing the wind in verse 30, defined in Strong's Concordance as strong, violent, forcible, Firm, in case you're wanting to wrap your mind around what kind of storm that they were in. You see, I believe here, being in the situation that they were in, fighting the sea, fighting that rough storm, that terrible storm, I believe that unless Jesus had come, they on themselves, by themselves, on their own, they were only in a, just a little ship, just a little boat, probably like a rowboat. Now, facing this a storm of this magnitude, I personally believe that unless Jesus had come along, I believe they would have perished. I absolutely believe they would have, the storm was going to go, and they, because the moment they stopped rowing and they stopped fighting the storm, the sea was just going to take them and easily could have capsized the boat. And then they all would have drowned, I believe, because of the magnitude of this disastrous storm that they were in. But what happens, and we know the story well, we studied it kind of two weeks in a row, really. Jesus comes along, and he gets into their boat, verse 32, and when, they, and when they, Peter and Jesus, got into the boat, the wind ceased. So the storm stops, Jesus gets in the boat, the storm stops, the sea calms down, and they're what? Verse 34, when they crossed over, they came to the land of Gennesaret. They made it to the other side. Notice that they only make it to the other side and the sea only calms down and the storm only calms down once Jesus gets in the boat. Not before. As he's walking along, they see him. He's there. But unless he's in the boat, until he got in the boat, the sea didn't calm down and the storm didn't cease. So what does this all mean for us, April 6th, 2014? I mean, okay, great. Jesus came and walked on the sea. That's pretty awesome, miracle, tremendous. Gets into the boat. You know, Peter cries out. They have this little exchange on the ocean. Peter walks on the sea, gets kind of, you know, Scared about all the stuff that's going on. He starts to sink. Jesus grabs him, helps. They both get in the boat together. The wind ceases. All right, great. Praise God for them. But what does it mean for us? What does this mean for us? What implication is made here to us? Well, if you guys remember correctly, Hebrews 13, 8. Just remember this about God. 
Remember this about Jesus Christ, that he has not changed. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. God has not changed. Neither has Jesus Christ ever changed. He's the same yesterday, which means that when Peter and the disciples were alive, today while we're alive, and then forever, into all eternity, forever, he'll be the same. He doesn't change. Well, there is an interesting parallel that we make here. There's an interesting parallel that we can bridge here. Because although we're not in a real boat right now, sitting in our living room, in our little house in McKinney, Texas, and we're not on the sea, and we don't have a literal storm beating against us, and a sea that's overcoming us and about to make us perish, there is an interesting parallel that we can draw from this passage where Christ came to them, got into the boat, and calmed the rough sea in the terrible storm. What is this parallel? What is it? The rough seas and the terrible storms of life that we face day in and day out. Every day that we wake up, easily in our lives, this whole world and living in this world and going to work and raising our families and doing all that we do are very easily rough seas and terrible storms. In fact, I would even go as far as to say that life itself, life itself parallels this sea that they were in. Life itself is a rough sea and a terrible storm. But you see, just like I just said, Jesus Christ doesn't change. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Praise be to God, there's hope for mankind today. There's hope for us today. Why? Why is there hope? What hope can we find? We well, see, Jesus Christ can still come, and he can still calm all the rough seas, and the terrible storms that we have in our lives today. Again, we may not be on a boat, but he can do that too. But the parallel here is that we all have rough seas and terrible storms that we face every day in our lives. And he can come just as he did for the disciples here, and he can calm those rough seas and those terrible storms. So who does he do it for? Does he just do it for anybody and everybody? Does Christ come and does he just automatically do it for everybody and the whole planet? Well, that's not what I see in my daily life. I meet a lot of people in my daily life. And he's not doing it for most of them. I can tell you that right now. Because I just see it in their face. And when I talk to them, I just hear it. He's not doing it for them. So who does he do it for? Who does he do it for? Well, we have our scripture as an example. What did he do here? Verse 30 with Peter. But when he, Peter, saw that the wind was boisterous, he was afraid and beginning to sink. He cried out saying, Lord, save me. So who does God Calm the rough seas and the terrible storms for? Who? Anyone that chooses to answer his call and follow him and surrender their lives to him and make them make him the Lord of their lives. And if you want to the, the parallel kind of parallel to like, you know, back to this, anyone that chooses to let him into their boats. You could say their heart. Anyone that lets him take control of their little ships or their lives, he'll calm the seas and he'll still the terrible storms. He even helps people go through because he always chooses, he always doesn't choose to calm those seas. But another thing he does, sometimes he just helps us get through those terrible storms, those rough seas. So he can help us go through these rough seas and these terrible storms.
What are some of the storms in life that people face? What are some of the storms in life that I have faced? Just, just a few here. Some storms, rough storms and rough seas and terrible storms that people face in life. People have marital problems. People go through problems in their marriage. Maybe a spouse leaves them after 20 years. Maybe a spouse just up and says, I, I just can't do this anymore. I'm out of here. That's a terrible, terrible storm. Maybe you had a serious car accident. Maybe you just got through with one and you're in the hospital. You listen to this. Now, what are you going to have after this? You're going to have huge medical bills. Oh, how do I pay them? Oh, these medical bills. I, I just don't know. I'm a, oh. How am I going to pay him? Oh my, it's just going to be on me forever. Maybe you lost a close loved one. Really love that. Mom, dad, son, daughter. Terrible, terrible, terrible. Terrible feeling. Horrible to lose a close loved one. Maybe you lost your job. Maybe you had a job yesterday, and all of a sudden they just laid off. And our economy today in, in April of 2014 is not really that good, especially here in America. And you're going, oh my gosh, <gasps> where am I going to get a new job? I got a family to support. Oh my gosh, and you're panicking. Because that's a terrible storm. That's a rough sea. And you maybe what from that could lose your home. Here's a possibility you and your family could be homeless. <gasps> oh my gosh. What am I going to do? Hey, oh my, what am I going to do? Any one of these one single events that would happen to people, any one of them take people down, could be and are a rough sea and a terrible storm. And people are having those types of things happen to them all the time in this world. These things right here are a part of this life that you live right now. And, pe and part of lives that people have lived for hundreds and thousands and thousands upon thousands of years. These kind of things have been happening to people. I call them, as we said today, the rough seas and the terrible storms of life. Before I let Christ into my little boat and let him take control, these types of rough seas and terrible storms literally destroyed me. I would classify my life before Jesus Christ, before today, before I knew him, as a literal shipwreck. My life was a disaster. I call it my old life, but I also call it my old death because that's how badly I was living. That's how horrible my life was. It wasn't really like life at all. It was like death because I was dying every day. My job, for instance, I hated everybody. My job, I was dishonest. I cheated people. I stole money from people that I knew, that I worked with. I was a horrible person on my job. But when you do those types of things, your conscience is just so burning inside of you. Don't do that, but you do it anyway. I did it anyway. My relationships with my wife and son, well, I was an abusive dad. And I was also abusive mentally to my wife. Me and my wife argued all the time, and I was always yelling at my boy because he just never could make me happy. Not because he was doing really anything wrong, but because I was such a miserable person, and I was filled with hate within me. To my mother and father, I was a horrible son. I was completely disrespectful. I didn't honor them. I didn't give them any reverence at all. In fact, all I did was argue with them. Fought. Horrible, horrible fights. And I was a mean, evil person. And I was a terrible son. My co-workers, 
They only work with me because they had to. They wanted a job. They needed their jobs as I needed my job. I complained at my job from the moment that I got there to the moment that I left. I complained. And I swore like a sailor about every single thing that happened. And I was mean and rude to people. And I was an unkind, unthankful, and evil person. In my life at that time, the only really care that I showed, because I didn't really feel any care for anybody, but the only really care that I showed was for those that benefited me in some way. If they could be a benefit to me, if I could profit from that relationship with them, then they meant something to me. If they didn't, then I just wouldn't have anything to do with them. I was only nice to those that I could get something out of. If I had any problems, my problems were the end of the world always. Any problem that I'd have, any little molehill of a problem that I'd have was a huge mountain to me. My problems really destroyed me, mentally and physically. Life gave me so many scars, my scars had scars. Life is a terrible storm and a rough sea. Daily, I drowned and died mentally in depression. So many times because of my problems, because of my rough seas and my terrible storms, that there was more than a couple times that I thought about suicide. I just couldn't handle life. The rough seas and the terrible storms were killing me. Killing me mentally and killing me physically. Every day of my life, they ate me alive. In, in my before Christ days, as I said earlier, suicide was often thought about. I was in sad, sad shape. As I said earlier, my life was a shipwreck. Until one day, one day, that I asked Jesus to get into my little boat. I said, Jesus, I need you. I don't want to live this life anymore. Jesus, I need you. And once I allowed Jesus to get into my boat and let him start steering me, he started calming all of my rough seas and all of my terrible storms of life. And guess what? He's still doing it to this very day for me. He's still calming all my seas, my terrible storms. Or, if he allows them to stay, he helps me through them. He helps me to make it successfully across to the other side every day of my life in peace. No more anger, no more evil, no more mean. Now kindness, love, joy, and peace would be the way I would describe my daily life. Because each day I, and even you, face terrible storms and rough seas in your life. We all, people, we all have problems, don't we? We all have terrible things that we face in our lives every day. But you see, with Christ on board and in control of your life, those rough seas and terrible storms are either calmed or we can sail through them with Jesus Christ as if they were not there. When they come, He helps me through safely. No matter what the problem is, He helps me safely and powerfully get through to the side of each and every day, no matter what I face. Which all lines up with the Bible, because the Bible says in Matthew 19, 26, Jesus said to them, with men, this is impossible. You could say with men, things, everything is impossible. But with God, all things 
are possible. And in Philippians 4, 13, the Bible says, Paul says of Christ, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. It's the same concept. And not only that, but when you allow Jesus Christ into your boat, when you allow him to take control of your ship or life, your life gets real interesting. Just look at the example with the disciples here in verses 35 and 36. Notice, they led Jesus on their boat. He got him safely across to the other side in verse 35. And when the men of that place recognized him, be Jesus, they sent out into all the surrounding region, brought to him all who were sick, and begged him that they might only touch the hem of his garment. As his, and as many as touched it were made perfect. So not only can Christ help you make it across to the other side successfully, but your life will become mighty interesting full of all kinds of different, interesting, powerful little miracles that'll happen on an everyday basis. And you see, Jesus Christ still works the way that he did here. He still works in those same ways today, but he works those ways, he does those things through us. He can do them through you. The life of a true disciple is full of all kinds of interesting events, even like these that we read about, which happened to Jesus right here in Matthew chapter 14. Jesus tells us, tells us in John 14, 12, Most assuredly I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also. And greater works than these he will do, because I go to my Father. So Christ promised that, not only if you let him into your boat, not only if you let him into your little boat and take control of your little life and let him into your little heart, will you be amazingly having peace and joy and able to make it with power and love and kindness, but you'll also be able to do amazing, awesome miracles and your life will be full of interesting Events like one that just so happened to me just a couple days ago, and I was on Harry Hines and Walnut Hill. You see, every couple weeks we go down to Dallas and we minister the gospel of Jesus Christ in a real way, face to face with people, facing people up and asking them where they're at with Jesus and talking to them about Christ and finding out where they're at as far as eternity goes. And we met this one fellow named Clint on Friday night at 7-Eleven on the corner of Harry Hines and Walnut Hill. And as we approached this man, he, he looked, he was just sitting there on, the, on this little parking bumper. And as we approached him, I gave him a track and I said, he were out here just talking about Jesus. And I said, what do you know about Jesus? And he stood up and before we started to talk about Jesus, he told us, he, all of a sudden, out of nowhere, he just grabs his left arm, his left shoulder. And he starts complaining about how badly his left shoulder and his left arm hurts. Then he began to tell us about the time that he had gone, where it had been some time now, where there was a time, this happened to him a while ago, where all of a sudden his left arm started to hurt. And we, started, we, we started to talk about heart attack. And yes, he was panicked, he was worried, because there would have been a time when it started that he called an ambulance. And an ambulance came out because he thought he was having a heart attack. The ambulance gets there and they check him out. They said, well, sir, your heart's fine. He says, I want to go to the hospital. I want to check this thing out. This thing's right. This is my left arm. They, you're not supposed to play around with your left arm. So they said, sir, we won't take you because there's nothing wrong with you. We see there's nothing wrong with you. But my arm and my, my shoulder, my arm. He said, sir, I'm sorry. So here we found him a couple nights ago out on Harry Hines and his car had broken down and he was waiting for his ride. And here we are, we just so happened, not, I believe it was a divine appointment by God, absolutely, to start talking to him about Jesus. And I asked him at that point, I said, uh, well, you know what, and the Lord prompted me. I said, well, you know, before we really start getting to talk about Jesus, I said, would you mind if I prayed for you, sir? He said, oh, no, please. 
Well, as I prayed for him, I laid my hand on his shoulder and his arm. And as I prayed for him, I prayed unto the Lord for his healing and for the pain to go away. Then I turned to the Lord says that it, when uh, Jesus was in the house with Peter's mother-in-law, he spoke to the fever that was in his mother-in-law and the fever left his mother-in-law and his mother-in-law got up and started to serve him. So in the midst of my prayer, I spoke to this man's pain that was in his arm, that was in his shoulder, and I commanded the pain to leave in the name of Jesus Christ. I finished praying and I got done. I stepped back and I started to talk to him about Jesus and find out where he was at with the Lord. And all of a sudden he cries out and he goes, wait a minute. My pain is all gone. What word my pain go? It's all gone. I don't have any more pain. He had had it for a while. Ambulance couldn't do anything. The paramedics couldn't do anything. And they wouldn't even take him to the hospital because they said so-called that he had nothing wrong with him. And yet here we are, Friday night. God allowed that pain to linger in his body so that he could prove himself how strong and mighty he was to this man. Because this man had known the Lord when he was younger, as we end up turning out to find out. But he had fallen away. He had backslidden and he wasn't living for Christ anymore. And the man, we left him in tears and we, we, we told him that what happened to him and we told him what God did to him and we told him how God revealed himself to him in a mighty way that night. And the man was in tears and I, I hope and I'll pray that the man will make a change in his life and he'll turn unto the Lord. But, but nevertheless, exactly what Jesus said in John 14, 12 is exactly happens to me and that kind of thing happens to me all the time. I pray for folks and then they get healed. God is still moving the same way that he did here in Matthew 14, 34 through 36. It's never a dull ride when you walk with Jesus Christ. It's never a dull ride if you walk with him, if you're his, if you're walking with him, if you've given him the control of your little ship and you've led him onto your little boat in your heart. It's never a dull ride with Christ Jesus. Now, you may be asking, you may be sitting out there thinking, you may be asking yourself, how can I live a life where Christ calms my storms and stills my rough seas and helps me through them in peace? How can I do that? How can I live that type of life and then have those awesome things happen to me? I want to do those awesome things for God. I want to heal those people. I want to do that kind of thing. I'm going to ask you right now, think of your life. Have you been fighting the rough seas and terrible storms of life all by yourself? And you're just going nowhere. You just can't seem to get anywhere. You feel like the disciples here rowing 16 to 18 hours, only halfway. Oh my goodness, what am I going to do? And you feel like your little boat is just sinking and your life is falling apart. You even maybe feel like I'm, I'm going to drown. I'm just, my boat's going to sink and I'm just going to drown. I'm just not going to make this one. I'm just not going to make it. So what's the answer? What's the answer? How can you live this life that I tell you about where Christ is calming all your storms and stilling all your seas? How can you live this kind of life? How? Ask yourself how. And if you don't know, I'm going to give you the answer. The Bible says that this kind of life can only be lived this kind of life can only be had starting at surrender. The surrender of the control of your little ship unto the control of Jesus Christ in his control of it, in his lordship over it, in his presence that's on it. What am I saying? Making the decision every day, every moment when you get up, every day, all through the day, to surrender your life unto Him, moment by moment, day by day. Because if Christ is not in control of your little ship, and if He's not steering you, misery will accompany you. The tough storms, the terrible storms, and the rough seas will break you down. And like me, like I used to be, will even kill you mentally and physically. So what is it? Letting him have the control of your ship every 
day, making decisions every day to just let Him have control of everything you do. Surrendering, waving the white flag. Lord, I've had enough. I just don't want to do it anymore all by myself. My boat's been sinking for a long time. I don't know how I've not died fully, but I know I've died mentally a lot of times. Lord, come in and take my ship. I just don't want to live like this, and I just don't want to row all by myself anymore. And by doing this, you invite Christ Jesus into your little boat. And He will enter into your boat like He did mine about 14 years ago. And He will calm all your rough seas and your terrible storms. And, it help, or, or, and He'll help you go through the ones that He doesn't calm, and you'll have peace going through them. You see, when these rough seas and terrible storms come, because they will come for every day for the rest of your life, you'll have some kind of rough sea and you'll have some kind of tough storm to face. Whatever it may be. That one child that you just can't get through to. That just that one guy at your job that's just like a nail in your back every single day. The one person that's on that road that just cuts you off and almost causes you to have an accident. The losing of your job, whatever, all these things, you will have the storms that come every day forever until you die. But you see, instead of fighting them all alone like the disciples did here for 16 to 18 hours, you can then call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. You can ask Him to save you and you can decide to put all of your trust in Him and His abilities and not your own and rest in Him completely and totally, 100%. Your choice, you can either start to surrender to Jesus and rest in Him and trust in Him totally and let Him lead you in a, in a life of peace or you can keep on going and trusting in yourself and trusting in others who will always let you down. I let myself down all the time. And if I let myself down and you know you let yourself down, you know people that you put your trust in are going to let you down too. And you can keep doing that you can keep going down that same road. You can keep sailing in that same boat and trusting in yourself and trusting in others and going through those rough seas and terrible storms of life and be miserable all by yourself, almost drowning unto death every day. And if you're anything like me, depression was an everyday thing I dealt with. And I hated life. God speaks to, on this same subject to the prophet Jeremiah in the 17th chapter of his book. And he gives us this same comparison as we talked about here today. And this was back about, oh, I don't know, a few thousand years ago. So you see, nothing's changed for us either. Because God speaks about it in Jeremiah 17, 5 through 8. I'm going to read it. God gives them the wrong way first. God talks to them about the wrong way to do things first. Tells them, he says, thus says the Lord... Cursed is the man who trusts in man and makes flesh his strength, whose heart departs from the Lord. Because you see, if you're trusting in man or you're trusting in self, you're not trusting in Jesus. You're not trusting in God. For he, listen to what God's description of, listen to the result of that kind of lifestyle. And this may sound, that's me, oh, pastor, that's me. For he shall be like a shrub in the desert. Ooh. The desert, desert's a dry, arid place. Not much life in the desert. So God says that that man that does that, maybe that's you that's doing that, shall be like a shrub in the desert. And you know what's happening? You're dying. You're withering away. And he, shall, and, and he shall not see when good comes. He shall inhabit the parched places, which means the dry, there's no life places, in the wilderness, in the salt land which is not inhabited. This was my life 14 years ago. I was a shrub in the desert, dying and withering and wilting every single day of my life. 
I did things the wrong way. Maybe you're doing things the wrong way. But in Jeremiah 17, 7 and 8, God tells Jeremiah and talks to us too about the right way to do things. The right way. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord. Notice, cursed is the man that trusted in themselves and in others. But blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord and whose hope is in the Lord. So that's the, that's the promise. The result, for he shall be like a tree planted by the waters. You know, a tree that's planted by the waters, their roots are always going toward those, water, those waters, and those waters always nourish and keep that tree healthy. He should be like a tree planted by the waters, which spreads out its roots by the river and will not fear when he comes. See, because when he comes, he's got his source of life. He's got his source of peace, which is that water that's right next to him. Just like you can have your source of peace, which would be Jesus Christ, which would be you could reach your roots toward him and take the life-giving nourishment that he has to offer you. And will not fear, and you cannot fear when the heat comes. But its leaf will be green. When you think of a green leaf, you think of an alive, flourishing plant. And listen to this. And will not be anxious in the year of drought. Because when the year of really, really tough times come, you don't have to be anxious. You can have peace in the year of the drought, nor will cease from yielding fruit. So that means even through the tough times, you can be a beautiful plant producing entity for God that's producing awesome fruit, even when terrible times come. The fruit of the one is death, folks. And the fruit of the one is life. Trusting in man is death. Trusting in yourself is death. Trusting in God and in Christ Jesus is life and peace. No anxiety, no anger, no evil. The God gives us the choice, you see. God's promises are there for everybody. God's promises of life and peace and joy are there for everybody. The only reason that you or I don't have them is because we don't take them. We don't have God's peace because we're not trusting in God. If we trusted in God and we put all our trust in Christ, we would have his peace all the time. And we would never have to worry ever again. Look at the promises that God gives us if we trust and obey him along with the results. Because you see, we can't just put our trust in the Lord and then just live however we want. God says, I must be, you must trust me and you must obey me. So look at the promises and the obedience or the promises that go to those that trust and obey along with their results. Isaiah 26, 3 through 4. God gives us a result here because he kind of says it a little backwards, but he says it the way God says it. God says you will keep him in perfect peace. That's the result. So, God, so God's telling Isaiah, you will keep this man in perfect peace why? Whose mind is stayed on you. A man whose mind is stayed on the Lord, who obeys the Lord, who trusts in the Lord, God will give him peace, perfect peace, because he trusts in you. Then he goes on to say, trust in the Lord forever. For in Yahweh the Lord, the result of that trusting in the Lord forever, is the Lord Yahweh, Jehovah God, is everlasting strength. Trust in ourselves, death. Trust and obey God is life. And as Isaiah put it here, perfect peace. For the one's mind who's stayed, the one's mind who's stayed on God. David writes in the 23rd Psalm about putting all your trust in the Lord along with those results. Listen to what he says. Verse 1, we just, it's only six verses. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. I'm completely trusting in God for everything. The Lord is my shepherd. He is my everything. I shall not want. Where I am, God, where you have me, 
I'm at peace because I trust in you. That's the trust part. Here's the result of that. He makes me, you could say because of that, he makes me lie down in green pastures. Ooh, that's peace. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness. The result of trusting and obeying God here was God made him just at peace. God takes care of everything. Doesn't have to worry at all. Verse 4, David says, And when bad times come, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Well, the opposite of fear is trust. If we just trust that God is with us, if we've given Him the control of our little ship and our little lives, yet they that I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall know. I shall not fear any evil. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. That's one that's submitted to whatever way God wants him to live. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. And the result? You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. The result of trust and obey is peace in life for eternity. Absolutely. <laughs> Jesus gives us a parable about this obedience in Matthew 7, 24-27. He says, Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, so we're trusting in him, we're listening to the things that he says, and we're not only listening to the things that he says, but we're doing the things that he said. Notice here, trust and obey. What's the result of the trust and obey? Jesus says, not me, Jesus says in verse 24, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And as I said earlier, the rough storms and the terrible, or the terrible storms and the rough seas are going to come. I will, liken to, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house. And it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. Even Jesus knows that those terrible storms and those rough seas are going to come. But if you listen to him and you trust him and you obey him, you shall be like a house built upon a rock. And when those storms come, he said, when the rains come, when the flooding comes, you will be like a house built on a rock. And guess what? You won't go anywhere. Your roots will be so deep and sucking off the flourishing river of life that's next to you, and they'll be so deep and so strong that you won't fail and you'll still bloom beautiful fruit even during the storm. But everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them. So if we're not going to trust and we're not going to obey the Lord and his teachings, he will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand and the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, and it fell. And great was its fall. So if we don't obey the Lord, and we don't trust in the Lord, and we don't do the things that he said, and we just maybe hear him, Jesus said, your house will be built like the one on the sand. And when all the storms of life come, you'll drown in the storm, you'll drown in the sea, and you'll die. Jesus just said it right there in Matthew 7, 24 through 27. John 20, 12, 26, the last one. If anyone serves me, let him follow me. Total obedience. God says, I want you to be totally obedient to me. Trust in me, yes, but absolutely you must obey. And the, here's, the, here's, the, it, here's the, if anyone serves me, let him follow me. This is the obedience part. What's the, what's the result of the obedience? He tells us right now. And where I am there, my servant will also be. And if anybody serves me, more obedience, him my father will honor. So if we obey and trust in the Lord, we will be where he is. And God will even honor us. There's lots of promises, folks. But they all trust with they all start with surrender and trust 
and obey as in everyday life, no matter what happens. I want to close today with examples of how you apply these to your life. I felt that God wanted me to give us examples of how we apply these things to our lives. How do we go about doing it? How do we go about applying this trust and obey thing to our life? I want to start with the deal of the surrender. Not only, not, not only does Christ calm all your storms and rough seas in your life so that you can have peace, but did you know that the surrender part is also the key that lets you into heaven. It's a requirement for eternal life. You must surrender and start to obey or you will die not only in this life. Not only will you die mentally, not only will you die spiritually in this life, but you'll die spiritually forever because if you never ever surrender to God and let Him into your little ship, what happens to that boat is it sinks. Because without Christ on board, you'll perish. Remember Matthew 16, 24 and 25, then Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. If you desire to save your life, you've got to let him on the boat. You must give up control of your little ship. You must surrender the control of yourself and you must give him the control. You must let him into your heart and let him into your life and take control because he knows how to steer you better than you ever will. I tried it for 25 years all by myself and I failed. I've met people that are still trying it and they're in their 50s and 60s and they're still living a life of failure of misery, of anguish. But God says in me you can have life, and life abundantly you can have peace. Whoever desires to save his life will lose it, giving yourself completely unto the Lord. And whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. If you lose your life in him, surrender your life unto him, you will save Yourself now, and you'll save yourself for eternity. So people, you must give Christ the total control of your life daily and surrender to Him for peace now and everlasting life later. If you don't, the opposite is true. If you don't, He won't. You see, God is a gentleman. He won't come in and just forcefully take the control of your life. He won't come in and force you and take it from you and say, no, it's mine. Because he gives you that right. He gives you that. He gives you your free will to either reject his life and peace-giving message now and his eternal life message forever. Jesus says, come to me, all you who labor, I'm rowing. All you who labor and are heavy laden. Oh, this life is so heavy. Oh, I just can't make it all. It's so hard. It's so heavy. Every step, Jesus says, come to me. All you who labor and are heavy laden. And I will give you rest. If you come to him in labor and being heavy laden, he will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, he says. For my burden, my yoke is light and my burden is easy. And in me, in me, you will find rest for your weary souls. Come to me, all you who labor and heavy laden. Come. Give him and surrender the control of your life unto him. Many, unfortunately, in our world today believe that they've done that. And yet there's no trusting in God at all. And then there's no obedience to God's word. People believe that they're disciples of Christ. People believe that they're Christians. And yet they don't obey what God said. And they don't even agree with the teachings of Christ. We met another man. Oh, I'm a disciple. Yes, I, 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 follow, I follow Jesus Christ. And on the one staple of Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life and no man comes to the Father but by me. He disagreed. 
that God, that Christ Jesus was the only way to heaven. Well, sir, all religions are really, you know, they teach all good and they're all. I said, sir, how can you call yourself a disciple of Christ? Jesus taught this, not me. Jesus did. You must trust and obey and your life has to line up in accordance with his teachings. Those who serve me, those who follow me will be where I am. Very plain, very simple. God wants the total control of your ship because he sees that your ship is sinking and he sees that your ship is about to go under and that you're about to drown. He doesn't want to take over control of your life because he's mean and he's a taskmaster and he's, he's just a big bad meanie and a big ruler and he just wants to destroy you. He wants to do just the opposite. He wants you to steer you clearly through all the obstacles in life. He wants to steer you clear of all those Terrible storms and those rough seas. And he wants to give you peace. He wants you to rest in him. If you don't surrender, God cannot save you. You just stop him from saving you even though he wants to. So you must surrender. So that's the surrender thing. God, here I am. I need you. I don't want to go back. Lord, I've lived that life and I don't want to go back. And you verbalize that and you cry out to God. And that's how you actively do it every day in your life. God, I don't want this anymore. I want you. I want to walk in you. I want, you to, I want to surrender to you. And I want you, just you, Lord. Just you. And then getting in his word every day and listening to what he told you to do. Now, how do you accomplish this trust thing? Total trust thing is what God wants. He wants you to totally trust in how do I do that in my life? How do I accomplish that one in my life? We well, see that one's a little bit more difficult. Even I, as a Christian, for almost well over 14 years, I still have problems with the trust things. But you know what? I, I make it, and I constantly go back to it. I, I'm, I'm working at staying in it too. So I'm going to impart some wisdom to you, some wisdom that God has just recently given me on this trust thing. You see, when problems come, notice I said when, because not if, when your problems come, when the storms come, when the rough seas that you're traveling through them, when, 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 because they will be there. They will come often, every day, if not. When the problems come, sit down, take a deep breath, and say, God, I don't have control of this situation and it's taken me under, but Lord, I put my trust in you. And I've just adopted a brand new saying that God just gave me. And here's the saying, no matter what comes your way, God, you got it. God, you got this one. But I'm losing my job, but I, I, my, my, my wife's leaving me, oh my gosh, I, no. Wait a minute, God. You've got it. In your mind, picturing Jesus giving, giving Jesus whatever problem it is, and then forgetting about it. And when it comes back up, when it comes back in your mind, because the devil doesn't want to let you forget it, neither does that flesh, neither does that skin that you live in right now, that tent. When it comes into your mind, no, nope, God's got it. No, nope, God's got it. I'm not going to worry about it. Lord, I trust in you. And then you tell him, Lord, I trust in you no matter what the outcome, Lord. You've got it. And I'm going to trust in you no matter what. No matter what. You've got it. And the Bible says that God wants the best for you. And since he wants the best for you, you can trust and rest in the fact that no matter whatever happens in your situation, God's going to work it out for your good and His glory. So you can effectively, every day, rest and trust in Him. It's not an easy thing. It's one, of the most, it's one of the hardest things you'll ever have to do in your whole life. But if you just, God's got it. God's got it. I'm putting it in your hands, Jesus. No, nope, I'm not going to worry about it anymore. And if it comes up a thousand times a day, a thousand times a day, God, you got it. <sighs> Taking a deep breath and resting in the Lord. 
Because just as we saw here, go back to verse 34 of Matthew 14. When they had crossed over, when they had crossed over, they came to the land of Gennesaret. In the storm, Jesus got in the boat and he helped them cross over. Whoo! Praise be to God. If anybody's struggling, I'm going to pray for you. It's not easy to keep trusting. And the devil will always tell you that God's unfaithful and that you can't make it or he's left you or whatever the lie is of that day. But don't believe him. He's a liar. Because if you belong to God and you've surrendered completely and you know God's got total control of your ship and you know God's in control of your life, no matter what happens to you, with God, in God, with Christ, all things are possible and I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. He can help you get across to the other side just like he did the disciples here even though they were about to perish in the sea. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for this word today, Lord God. Thank you so much, Lord God, that you are so faithful. You are so faithful, Daddy. And you can help us across to the other side of any problem that we're having in our lives. Any terrible storm or rough sea that we're going through, Lord, you can calm it if we just surrender and trust in you. Lord, I pray for any out there that are struggling and they just can't surrender. They just, they just how do I do it? I just, I, I just, but, 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 but I just can't trust the Lord that he's, oh, Lord, I just pray that you would show them how faithful you are, that they would study you in your word and see all the times you helped those that surrendered and trusted in you to get through those rough storms and those terrible storms. There's those rough seas and those terrible storms of life. Because the disciples had them too, Lord. We read about them in Scripture, Lord. The disciples had them too. And yet you helped them get through the rough seas and the terrible storms of life. And yet you helped them get to the other side. In spite of almost drowning. Despite of the terrible, terrible storms they faced. I pray, Lord God, that they would see that they can trust in you no matter what and continue to rest in you and trust in you and just fight it every day if the devil keeps coming. Nope, God's got it. Give them that, just give them that confidence, Lord Jesus. Give them that confidence and show them how, how trustworthy you really are. And Lord, I just pray, God, for all of us, Lord, that we would just see that you are so trustworthy. And that you can take us across no matter what it looks like and no matter how bad it is. If we just, we can keep walking on the water as Peter sank, but Lord, we can keep walking on the water as we've all sunk. But Lord, we can keep walking on the water if we just look at you and trust in you and forget about all the storms that are going on around us. You can lead us through in peace. And Lord, we can trust you that you will. I love you and I praise you, dear God. Help all of us, Lord, to keep resting and keep trusting in you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.